Welcome back guys to another MP4 of how to fill that emptiness inside of you with material possessions. And this hot little box of metal and plastic is the Mamiya M645, or as I like to call it, the I don't like shooting Hasselblad square format, 645. Just checking on you guys. I hope gravity is still working wherever you are. Get comfortable if that's something you're into. But let's talk about this camera. Mamiya made these from 1975 to 1987, which means they're basically as old as my dad. I guess that makes the Mamiya M645 daddy. These cameras were made entirely in Japan, which means that after all that time, these cameras will probably still work properly, which is a good thing. We like that. In addition, this camera won the Good Design Award from the Japanese government, which I think is a little bit like when my mom calls me handsome. Not that she does that. In addition to the Mamiya M645, they also produced an evil twin called the Mamiya 1000S. It had a few changes, but most notable was the shutter speed was, you guessed it, was moved to 1,000th of a second. But the fastest shutter speed, you guessed it, was moved to 1,000th of a second. I, I do have to say though, that after the 1000S model, um, things get a little Daryl Hannah, which is to say, a little plastic. This is a medium format, not a small format, not a large format. Um, this is more specifically the 645 format, which is 6 centimeters by 4.5 centimeters, uh, giving you that nice aspect ratio that we're familiar with with modern digital cameras, the 4.3. So that's good. So we're going to get usable images, not the weird Hasselblad square 6x6. When looking to make the jump to medium format, aspect ratio is my second most important consideration. The first most important consideration, sex appeal. Obviously, I mean, look at it. It's a great looking old camera. Actually figuring out how to put film in this camera was a little tricky at first. That or I'm really stupid. There are two buttons on the back that need to be pressed at once and I'm actually not gonna open it for you guys today because I have a roll of film inside it that I haven't finished yet. We're, gonna, we're not gonna blow that up. Anyway, there are two buttons that you have to press at the same time which is tough considering I can barely chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. Looking at the back, this needs to be pressed and the one with the arrow on it, as you would guess, needs to be slid over and you have to do that at the same time and then the back pops open. Once you've penetrated the shield, you can see where the magic happens inside, you know, where the sausage is made, so to speak, where the where the brass is taxed. Once inside, all you gotta do is pinch the film holder and it'll pull right out. No joke to be made there. One tip here, when you are pushing the film holder back in, there is a really decisive positive click that you'll feel. Um, and you're gonna wanna make sure that you feel that before you close the camera back up on it. One potential drawback to this camera and something that may not be obvious by looking at it is this doesn't have interchangeable backs. So once you put a roll of film in the back of this thing, you are married. You are shooting 16 shots or you're opening the back prematurely, which is the situation I'm in today. So that's something to note. Although you can put a 220 film holder in the back, but who's got a stockpile of that sitting around? If you couldn't tell by looking at it or you hadn't done the research before, this is a completely manual camera, which means nothing inside it is done electronically. There is one caveat to that though. It's got this little red button here, which is a battery check light. And you can see, I'll hold it up there for you guys. It turns that little, turns that little green light on. And that's kind of a weird thing because you, you control the lens manually, you control the aperture manually, you obviously uh, advance the film manually, um, set your shutter speed manually. Everything is manual but it takes a CR2 battery. Lucky for us, those are still widely available. Apparently the shutter is electronically activated and if you don't have a battery inside it, you're confined to a specific shutter speed. There are, there are just a smidge of electronics in this thing. Just to go over some of the basic functions of this camera with you, uh, this camera has two shutter buttons. You've got one threaded one down here on the front, if you can see where I'm pointing, and then another one up on the top. And as best as I can tell, there is no way to lock these. I have to say that I've unfortunately wasted a few shots by either bumping or accidentally pressing one of the two shutter buttons, because there's a lot of opportunities to hit it. Very easy to pick your camera up like that and accidentally uh, smash one of them. Speaking of smashing, you might, you know, if you could, the, as I said previously, the front shutter button is threaded and allows you to use most cable releases. It would not accommodate a Super Nintendo controller. On the left side of the camera is a prominent knob. And no, this is not a tiny game of Wheel of Fortune. This is how you select your shutter speed. Slowest it'll go is eight seconds. The fastest it'll go on this one is unfortunately a 500th of a second, which can be confining. Uh, thus the need for the, uh, the, the replacement of this camera, the 1000S. This gigantic lever over here is the film advance lever, which Mamiya proudly touts is interchangeable. You're big into customizing your advance lever. This is your camera. Not only does that CR2 battery power the shutter like we talked about earlier, but it also provides power 
up top to, a, to an optional prism finder. I have the waist level finder, the sports finder they call it. I'm going to pick up the prism finder at some point in the next little bit and I will get the, the metered one um, just to make life a little easier. Um, there, there are definitely situations where having the ability to instantly meter would be, be handy. But I'm, but I'm using the waist level finder because I'm trying to live out my Hasselblad fantasies. Let me live my life. The prism is dope though, primarily because it flips the image and you're not forced to live in some stupid upside down reversed world where everything is backwards and you can't aim. As I indicated a second ago, the waist level finder is referred to as the sports finder. BRB, gonna go shoot brawn on this. I don't see how anybody would shoot sports on this. I'm, just, I'm assuming it was done in the past, uh, but it beggars belief to me that that was possible or even considered. Figuring out how to open the waist level finder for me was like a, like a tiny scavenger hunt when I first got the camera. It wasn't immediately obvious how to do it, just to let you know, so that you don't have to go on the same hunt. This part is obvious, right? So you're gonna open the top right here, and then everything pops up. But then you're only looking through through the ground glass like that. And I, you can see inside, there's the little, the little magnifier, little focus magnifier. And I could not for the life of me figure out how to get that out. Um, you'll notice there's this little silver tab. And I don't know if you can see it. I'm trying not to, trying not to fire off a shot, which is easier said than done. Uh, but there's this little silver tab right here. I don't know. And you'll check that out. What a very satisfying thing. So you just push that over um, and it allows the, uh, the magnifier to come up. You pinch in the sides and it goes right back down. You know, we talked a little bit about the prism finder. There are several prism finders available for this camera. I'm not gonna try to name all the different ones, but I think there are four um, ranging in cost and expense and also capabilities. So just uh, do your research there and you'll figure out which one you want. Putting the pris optional prism finder on the camera though is gonna change the size and weight. Um, it's gonna make the camera a lot bigger and maybe a little more unwieldy. I like the waist level finder because it collapses down and goes in my backpack nice and easy. And most of the time I'm not really in a hurry. Um, I don't need to shoot quickly. So um, I have I don't have a lot of benefit for the, for the prism finder normally, but your miles may vary. There's a little window over here on the side of the camera which counts all the way to 16, which is impressive if you're a toddler. In my mind, one of the coolest features and thing that I enjoy the most about this camera is the ability to lock up the mirror. And you'll hear me flipping it over here. This is the lever that does it. This is a big camera and this is a big mirror. So it's a lot of motion. Um, and as landscape photographers know, jarring, movement, all that kind of stuff, uh, big no-nos. And inside a camera like this, you've got the equivalent of a pterodactyl flying around, creating so much motion and movement. So the ability to lock the mirror up so it's not slapping around inside when you're taking a shot, awesome. The way that you're gonna use that is you're gonna focus your shot, get everything the way you want it, and then you're gonna lock the mirror up because the mirror is what allows you to see the image through the top of the camera. So that's how that works. I think it's important at this point, and you'll see that I've got them over here to talk about the lenses for this camera. Boy, there are some dandies for the uh, Mamiya, Mamiya 645 system. This camera system was around for almost 50 years, so obviously they, they, were, con they were continuing to put out lenses for a really long time, um, upgrading their designs. It was a really well-developed system when it was out. Um, I've got three, but I have one lens right here that I think is going to be the one that uh, could potentially move you over to this system. The, the thing, this is, this is one of the primary reasons why I landed on this system. Uh, this is the fastest medium format camera lens that I'm aware of. It's the Mamiya 80mm 1.9, which gives you the equivalent bokeh of like a 51.1 in full, full frame land. So really, really cool lens, excellent for portraits. It just destroys the background. It's nice and sharp, especially if you stop down a stop or two. Uh, a brilliant lens. All of the older Mamiya lenses, like the ones that I'm holding here, they're they're all metal construction, really, really nice build quality. You're not gonna talk too much about the particulars of them, but really nice lenses. Um, very affordable too. I think I paid about 350 for this one, and I just picked this one up in Santa Fe, New Mexico for about 100 bucks at a camera store. Um, shout out to the dark room in, Sa in Santa Fe. This is the 210 millimeter lens, so a moderately long telephoto. The other lens that I'm using, the one that's on the body and the one that sees the most use, is the uh, 45 millimeter, which I think works out to be about a 35 or somewhere around there. This lens system is really well developed. I mean, there's everything from a 24 millimeter to a 500 millimeter lens available and the prices are great on all of them. I found this to just be a really capable system, really small and lightweight. I love the fact that I get 16 shots on the 645 format. So what are my impressions of the camera? In terms of size and weight, it's actually pretty small and light. 
So yeah, I mean, I'm holding it here. I, this is five or six pounds, maybe as many as seven. This is heavy. I mean, this pumps some iron here. Kind of a heavy camera, but this is a medium format camera system we're talking about here, and everything's mostly metal construction. So there's really no way to avoid size and weight if you're wanting to play this game. There are smaller cameras. I know the Hasselblad 500CM is a little smaller and lighter, um, but this is pretty much par for the course. Um, I look at the RZ67 and shutter. If this is a moon, the RZ67 is a whole planet, has its own, has its own gravitational field. But there's no way to accommodate that big negative without um, some size and weight. One negative of the camera is I am really not sure how to put on a camera strap and make it make any sense. So that's the way it's supposed to go. There are two little, two little clasps on the end. I don't have a camera strap that'll work on it. So still looking for that. So most of the time I just leave it on the tripod and lug it around on the top of my tripod, which is not elegant at all. I will say that like the McDonald's dollar menu, the Mamiya M645 represents one of the last great values in medium format film photography. There's a lot of YouTube channels doing pretty similar stuff to what I'm doing right here. Kyle McDoodle, Granny Days, uh, all these, all the dudes, right? All those guys have cameras that they like and enjoy and they've touted on their channels. This is one that hasn't really got a lot of praise. And I think honestly, it's a matter of time before one of the bigger YouTubers starts to use this camera system and the prices are driven up on that. Um, look at the uh, RZ67 process since Will Willem Verbeek started using that camera. That was a camera that was around this same price range two or three years ago. Uh, Willem's channel got really big and the price of that camera went up just the same. So I think this camera still represents a really good value. Maybe my little humble video will be the one that drives up the prices of that camera. Who knows? But you can pick up this body for two or $300. I'm still in really good condition most of the time. I, this came from Japan, the one that I'm using. And the lenses are all great too. Just to kind of put it in perspective in my in my lineup of cameras, you'll you'll notice on the shelf back there I have the Nikon FM2. Since I bought this camera, basically no no interest in shooting the Nikon FM2. Very easy to use camera, uh, very intuitive. I prefer a slower, deliberate shooting style. Um, I'm not trying to shoot a thousand pictures a day. Usually if I go out and can shoot a couple pictures um, that I'm satisfied with, it's been a good day of shooting. So this camera suits my style. The negatives are great. Very good images that come out of this. The lenses are all wonderful. It's a it's a great camera. The camera to me is superbly easy to use. It's really, really easy to use. Everything's all manual and everything just works like you think it should work. It's a camera, right? You're gonna advance the film, you're gonna press the shutter button, you're gonna control your aperture, shutter speed, and focus. I mean, it's a camera, right? And everything is exactly where you would think it would be. A, a couple of weird quirks and little things that you should be aware of with this camera. I will say that it's a little bit like that scene in Interstellar when you're trying to mate the camera lens to the body, right? It has to be just so. And I mean, you're you're turning the camera and turning the body, trying to make it up uh, very hard. So just, just so you're aware, um, that can be a point of frustration. There's gonna be something you're look, gonna look for. I'm not gonna try to explain it, but you're gonna be looking for the specific way to line the lens and the body up, um, and it's very tight, kind of making it work. And until you've done it a few times, um, you're gonna be fiddling around and, and feel like you're scratching your stuff up all to pieces. Not great. So that's kind of annoying. Um, another thing, I like the fact that it shoots 16 shots, right? Uh, the 30 shots or the 24 shots on 35 millimeters, sometimes that's, that's a lot of commitment, right? Like sometimes you're not willing to go out and do 36 shots, right? But you just don't, you don't have a subject that's interesting enough to want to take 30 something shots. You're at 16 on this camera system. Well, for some folks, particularly folks like me, that still may be too much commitment, right? You may be going out you know, shooting something very small and, and you don't need 16 shots worth. I have a roll of Cinestill 800T in there and I just really don't have anything to shoot. I don't want to waste the remaining couple shots, but here we are. So you are committed to 16 shots when you load this camera up. There's no way to change the back. And in, in later cameras, the Hasselblad 500s, the RZ67s, those cameras do have interchangeable black backs. So that could be seen as a potential drawback of this camera here, but your miles may vary. In conclusion though, my recommendation would be that you don't buy this camera. It's not that there's anything wrong with this camera, is it's that there was a more refined version the 1000S, and had I done more research, I would have paid the $50 more and just got the 1000S. This camera is fantastic, completely fantastic and works great, but if I'm doing it over, I'm buying the 1000S because it's everything this one is, but a little better. So that would be my recommendation here, guys, is just skip this one and go to the 1000S. The additional shutter speed that you're gonna get with that will definitely help you out. 
But all in all, my trip to medium format land has been an enjoyable one. I've really, really enjoyed my time with this camera. I'm gonna keep shooting it. I've got tons of rolls of 120 film that I can't wait to shoot through this thing. Uh, it's a beautiful camera, works really well, and I would recommend you guys picking one up or at least grab the 1000 S so you don't make the same mistake I did. But as always, guys, thank you for watching my videos, and we'll see you next time.